Um, so welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for folks who are joining. Um, today we are going to be talking about the transgender homelessness crisis and how compounding criminalization impacts on how trans and gender nonconforming individuals. Um, at some points during the presentation, you may hear the acronym uh, TGNC, which stands for Trans and Gender Nonconforming, um, and how these awesome panelists are organizing to fight back against the crisis. Um, so I'm just going to get started um, with a little bit of intro and context. Um, so the National Homelessness Law Center um, is a national legal organization dedicated to preventing and ending homelessness. Um, the law center itself sort of has three big buckets of uh, project areas. One of those is housing. So working on accessibility of affordable housing and housing choice vouchers, making sure that uh, low income tenants have protections against eviction um, and discrimination. Um, the second bucket is youth homelessness work. So ensuring that youth um, who are experiencing um, housing insecurity and homelessness know their rights to education, um, have access to the resources and things that they need and are not penalized under status crimes like curfew laws and things like that. Um, and the third bucket and the bucket that's sort of gonna be the most pertinent today is the criminalization bucket. So working on identifying, tracking, analyzing, and fighting back against laws, policies, and programs that make it illegal or otherwise practically uh, difficult and impossible um, for folks experiencing homelessness and poverty to exist in public spaces. The Housing Not Handcuffs campaign is a campaign sort of under that criminalization umbrella um, formed in 2015. It's a coalition of attorneys, advocates, activists, and folks with lived experience. Um, working to decriminalize homelessness. So the goals of today's webinar, um, number one is to link movements to decriminalize status with movements to decriminalize identity as a means of building power through intersectionality. So we recognize that people who are living unhoused, um, that does not comprise all of their identity. For some of them being unhoused may be an important part of their day-to-day -day life, but people also have myriad other identities and statuses that they hold at the same time. And in order to be effective advocates, we need to recognize that people hold multiple marginalized identities at once and ensure that we're advocating from the margins in the work that we do. Um, the second goal is to elevate and amplify the experiences of a group of people who have largely been left out of movement building. So often when we talk about decriminalizing homelessness and poverty and ending homelessness in our communities, um, you know, as of lately, people are much more willing to talk about the fact that this is an issue that affects Black, um, Indigenous, and people of color more, that it may affect people living with disabilities more, but we really need to be more intentional and in intentional about our intersectionality writ large. Um, trans and gender nonconforming people disproportionately experience housing insecurity and homelessness, um, and though it's an active group of activists, um, those folks have largely been left out of a lot of movement building around homelessness in general. Um, and then the third goal is to learn about and get involved with advocacy in support of trans and gender nonconforming unhoused communities. Um, so really quickly, what is criminalization? What do we mean when we talk about criminalization? So criminalization in general is the act of turning an activity into a criminal offense by making it illegal, or the act of turning a person into a criminal by making their behavior illegal. Criminalization is sometimes state codes and municipal ordinances and you know, laws and policies, but it also can be programs, practices, um, anything that we see that the government or quasi-government or private individuals are doing to target individuals' behavior for exclusion or punishment. Um, so that means that criminalization can really look like a lot of different things. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. When we talk about criminalization of homelessness specifically, we're talking about laws, policies, programs, and practices that restrict or prohibit different categories of survival conduct performed by people who are living while unhoused or unsheltered. This can include sleeping in public, resting in public, asking for help in public, um, living in vehicles in public spaces, really a lot of things that those of us who may be traditionally housed um, take for granted and do every day as a means of survival. Um, so just really, really quickly, because this isn't the crux of today's webinar, but I do just want to talk a little bit about what we know about criminalization of homelessness in cities. So at the local level, um, we've looked at close to 200 cities 
across the country and laws that they have on the books that criminalize homelessness. We know, for example, that 72% of cities have at least one law prohibiting camping in public. Almost two thirds of cities um, have at least one law restricting living in vehicles. And we are seeing increases in these types of laws, both since 2006, when the Law Center first started tracking these laws, and then particularly in the last few years when there's been a real uptick in criminalization, both at the city and the state level. So at the state level, again, this is another report that the Housing Not Handcuffs campaign has done, but we know that 48 out of 50 states and the District of Columbia have at least one statewide law criminalizing homelessness across the state. So that can be a statewide camping ban, it could be a statewide panhandling ban, it could be a statewide ban against living in vehicles, um, it could look like a lot of different things. As we mentioned, the, the definition of criminalization is more than just state codes and municipal ordinances. So here are just some headlines of ways that governmental agencies have criminalized homelessness through things like executive programs and policy choices. Um, anytime you know, law enforcement is involved with sweeping a homeless encampment, um, displacing people from their communities, that would be considered criminalization as well. So linking our movements together. Um, so just put an Audre Lorde quote here at the top, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives. We know that people experiencing homelessness are criminalized for being unhoused. We also know that people who are trans and or gender non-conforming are criminalized for their gender identity. And we know that it's impossible to succeed in decriminalizing either of these statuses and identities without understanding these movements and struggles as interconnected. So the purpose of today's webinar is to be really intentional about having those conversations, linking our movements and building power for everyone. Um, and I will turn it over to Alex. Thank you, Lily. Um, hello again, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Lily, for that great overview of the context that we're coming to this conversation from. We wanted to just front load that context and then turn everything over um, to our speakers because that's really where the magic is going to lie today. Um, so I'm just going to give a quick introduction to these wonderful folks who are here. Um, and they're pretty incredible, so bear with me because it's it's not necessarily going to be brief, but um, take a listen. Because today we have with you, starting from Sasha, we have Sasha Alexander. Sasha is a non-binary, trans, Black, South Asian artist, educator, and healer. They are also the membership director and co-director of the movement building team of the Sylvia Rivera Law Project, which is an amazing, um, legendary, I would almost say, New York City legal and movement based organization working towards collective liberation. And so in this role there, Sasha works to strengthen the leadership of trans and gender nonconforming and intersex people and specifically low income people, disabled folks, formerly incarcerated people, people living with HIV, immigrants and people of color. Sasha has been working at the intersections of all these things and in the intersections of LGBTQ youth, media, economic, gender, and racial justice movements for over 20 years. Um, in 2013, after the murder of 21-year-old Eastland Nettles, uh, Sasha took this 10 years at that time of experience in this work and launched Black Trans Media, an organization committed to addressing the intersections of racism and transphobia by shifting and reframing the value and worth of Black lives. Sasha was named one of the inaugural Trans 100 for her organizing and media-based work in trans community of color. Um, and in the time when he's not doing all of that incredible work, Sasha loves spending time on the land, decolonizing everything, trans reproductive futures, their cat, art, and movement history. And if you haven't noticed, um, Sasha uses she, he, and they pronouns and really um, insists that we all mix it up or use their name. Um, so thank you, Sasha. I'm so excited to hear from you. Moving on next, we're going to head over to Kayla Gore. Kayla is a co-founder and director of programs um, of My Sister's House in Memphis, Tennessee, um, which is a project that began when Kayla and fellow co-founder at the time, Eliana Watchall, just recognized the severity of the housing and homelessness crisis that um, trans people of color were facing in Memphis and started doing the work that the city would not and providing emergency housing for people. 
um, at that time out of their own homes. And since then, My Sister's House has grown into a fiery grassroots organization that provides emergency housing, advocacy and organizing, and really essential multi-pronged resource assistance for trans and gender non-conforming people of color by trans and non-conforming, gender non-conforming, sorry, people of color. Um, and so through this work, Kayla has coordinated homelessness services, direct outreach, a ton of organizing and advocacy around issues of housing equity and police accountability. Kayla has raised at least over 60,000, sorry, $600,000 as part of this work to buy land and build permanent housing, um, which then is given to trans and gender nonconforming folks in Memphis, particularly trans women of color. And again, something the state just refuses to do and claims is impossible. Um, and I actually just heard from Kayla right as we were getting on that um, they're lined up to complete the 10th house um, by the end of this year. So it's really incredible work. Kayla is a major thought leader in her community and provides all kinds of training on trans inclusivity to educational institutions, healthcare organizations, businesses, et cetera. And you can see her and her work featured across major news and media outlets, including in a feature episode of National Geographic's Impact Series hosted by Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman. So very excited to have you with us here today, Kayla. And last, but definitely not least, we have Chinere Azie, um, a nationally recognized civil rights lawyer and social justice advocate specializing in constitutional litigation and anti-discrimination. Uh, she's currently a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights, another legendary legal organization, uh, where she focuses on issues of racial justice, gender justice, LG LGBTQI rights, and governmental abuses of power. And as part of that work, Chinere is the lead counsel for trans rights activist Ashley Diamond, um, who in her you know, path-breaking legal challenge against the Georgia Department of Corrections. Prior to joining CCR, Chinere was a staff attorney at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and, and after that, a trial attorney for the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She's a Fulbright scholar. She's the originator of the Boycott Product Campaign. She's a regular speaker at social justice convenings across the country. She's been recognized as one of the top LGBT lawyers under 40. She's on the board, why I need to take a breath, the list is so long. She's on the board of directors for the National Trans Bar Association and the Transgender Law Center. And I was honored and lucky to get the chance to work with her directly as an intern while I was in law school. So I can attest to the fact that she's also just an amazing supervisor and mentor um, and all around powerhouse. So thank you for being with us, Chinere. Um, it's an honor to have you all here. And I think with that, um, we should just turn it over to you all. Um, does that, are people ready? My speakers? Okay, we're gonna dive right in. So, you know, we gave some very scant statistics in the registration for this event. Lily touched on it in our intro, but, you know, I'm hoping that you guys can, you know, just start this conversation by telling us some more about what we know already about the scope and scale of the problem of homelessness among trans and gender nonconforming folks. Um, so maybe actually, Chinere, can you get us started on this one? Absolutely, and um, thank you um, for the very kind introductions and, and thanks to everyone who's listening in for your engagement of these issues, which are so very impactful um, for members of the trans and gender nonconforming community. Um, but you know, the unfortunate statistic is that um, transgender and gender nonconforming people um, really experience shocking rates of homelessness relative to the general population. Um, studies, recent studies have found that one in three members of the transgender community um, have experienced or will experience homelessness in their lifetimes, which is um, an order of magnitude greater than um, the, the risk level that most members of um, the U.S. population face. And um, if you look at youth, you see even more um, shocking statistics um, that are tantamount to um, LGBTQ plus youth, you know, taking that as, as a whole umbrella, experiencing homelessness at a rate that is 120% higher than um, youth who um, do not hold those identities. Um, one of the themes you'll hear um, today is, is um, sort of that discrimination is often a push factor that um, leads LGBTQ plus people and, and transgender people specifically into homelessness. 
And um, that includes um, familial discrimination, um, family push out, school push out, um, unemployment, um, employment discrimination that leads to um, really disparate rates of unemployment um, and poverty, um, as well as um, you know, discrimination um, in school settings, et cetera, that again, just really expose um, trans people to uh, much higher rates of um, economic precarity. Another unfortunate theme that you'll hear today is um, really some of the ways that um, transgender and gender nonconforming people find the existing shelter system to be incredibly unsafe. And so in addition to having rates of um, homelessness that really exceed um, the, re the rest of the population and, and mean that at times, um, particularly in the case of youth, you know, up to 40% of people experiencing homelessness at any time will be from the LGBT, um, LGBTQ plus community, which is again, really an outrageous statistic. You also have um, higher than average amount of people um, who are um, homeless um, and trans or gender not conforming also um, being unsheltered, which is to say, um, you know, at times sleeping out on the streets. And that's really because again, um, the existing shelter system um, whether it's because of kind of um, the, the ways that sex segregated um, and ways that really can be hostile to trans and gender nonconforming people, um, the ways that um, they're administered with tremendous amount of discretion, oftentimes by religious organizations that are openly hostile to transgender, gender nonconforming people, um, the ways that um, people experience violence and discrimination and harassment within shelters not just from um, other um, cisgender people who are at the shelters, but also um, far too often from staff. And you know, the really um, unclear federal picture at times about um, you know, the, the rules, the rule of law that should apply. Um, for those of you who work in this space, you might be familiar with the equal access rule um, that initially um, under Obama was meant to ensure access um, um, to housing based on gender identity for transgender people. It was you know, quickly the subject of um, controversy and pushback from the, from the right. Trump issued um, a superseding regulation that sought to, in, in essence, um, deputize shelter workers to profile people who are transgender, you know, even going as far as to provide guidance about how to spot transgender people and you know, authorizing them to forcibly eject them from, from shelters um, where they would otherwise be housed by gender identity. You know, that rule thankfully um, was rescinded, but you know, all that to say, um, you know, there's really been um, a lot of opportunity for mischief at the shelter level that has again contributed to the statistic that you know, 63% um, of transgender people who are homeless and 80% of non-binary people who are homeless um, are ultimately unsheltered um, relative to um, less than 50% of people who identify cisgender having that same statistic. So um, again, um, the picture is, is rather bleak. It's an area where um, that we need a lot of attention. And as you'll hear more today, um, you know, it's really going to require um, dismantling what I what I refer to as the discrimination to incarceration pipeline, which is to say, um, you know, understanding that tra trans homelessness has underlying roots in, you know, the culture of discrimination and transphobia that we've allowed to persist, um, and that attacking those problems, understanding that without without resolving them, not only will you have elevated levels of homelessness, but also elevated experiences. Um, of, of being in the system of mass incarceration that are quite disproportionate, you know, that those are gonna be the predictable results. And we really have a role as, you know, social justice workers to, to really be disrupting those forces wherever we see them um, and providing safety and, and housing to our community. So with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to Alex. Thank you, Jenere. And, it, you know, I should have said this maybe at the beginning, but um, the way this is going to work is we're going to have certain panelists leading the discussion and then anyone else can jump in. So I guess I just want to take a minute um, and see with uh, Kayla and Sasha, is there anything else that you wanted to 
pitch in if you to this question of just what we already know about the scope of the problem before we move along. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I definitely want to stand behind and beside those facts um, and that data that was just given to us because it really happens. But I also want to like hone in on the fact that like me being in the South and organizing in the South, a lot of the federal legislation and the federal protections that we had uh, under hood really didn't apply here because uh, as it was said, a lot of the organizations that provided emergency shelter here in the South were faith-based. They didn't receive HUD funding, which meant they weren't, you know, they weren't affected by any dollars that would be taken away from them. They're faith-based, they're funded by their, their, their uh, constituents, their, their members, community members. And at the time that we started My Sister's House, there were 71 beds for emergency shelter in the city of Memphis with a population of almost a million, 1.2 million people. None of those were designated for LGBT people. And then when you think about trans people, they definitely weren't designed for them. People would contact the community center looking for shelter and, and shelters would do exactly what Trump said to do. They would ask about genitalia. They would ask about the safety and comfort of the people who were already in the shelter, not the person who was living on the street, you know, in fear of death. Um, but we'll get into more of that with uh, the questions that we already have uh, planned. And I'm pretty sure that the people who are uh, tuning in may have some questions as well. And I'm gonna pass it to Sasha. I appreciate you, Kayla, um, for adding that context. Um, when we think beyond like a place like New York City, where I think, you know, where I am, oftentimes people think that um, it's a welcoming environment for LGBT people or TGNC people, and that's actually certainly not the case. Um, even though there are some incredible policies um, on the books, they don't necessarily have teeth, um, and we don't necessarily see them uh, actually, uh, uh, people are not able to actually live a life where those policies have an effect on their safety. And so, for example, here in, in New York City, in 2006, SRLP was instrumental in changing the policy about sex segregated spaces and shelters. Now that is, you know, more than 15 years ago, and you could still talk to trans and gender nonconforming or non-binary people who uh, have to access the shelter system here, who are turned away from the shelter that they feel they're safest in, right, because of their gender expression or gender identity or presentation. Um, and so, I mean, at a shelter system like New York City, there's you know 50 to 60 thousand people. Um, in that system. And so there's already uh, quite a lot of people moving through it and um, quite a lot of violence that people navigate um, in the shelter system, both um, carceral type violence from security and um, over-policing. Um, and obviously that impacts um, TGNC people. And I just wanted to share really quickly in 2019, our shelter organizing um, team at SRLP did uh, a survey of about 30 of our folks who were currently in the shelter system. And from that survey, um, we had folks who were from 20 years old to 62 years old, um, who had ranged in shelter from three weeks to 13 years on and off. And that's one of the other patterns we see, which is because of the violence um, that TGNC people specifically uh, face in shelter, oftentimes people cannot stay in shelter, which in New York City, is one of the only pathways into permanent housing. Um, so that just creates a long-term uh, houselessness and a uh, problem for TGNC people strictly because of their gender identity um, or gender expression. And I also wanted to share from that survey, 90% of the people, of uh, the respondents reported that shelter conditions caused them or others concerns around mental health. The 90% of the people who were respondents felt the shelter was not accommodating their needs. Uh, more than 80% of people were reporting being denied services such as transportation, toiletries, 82% citing that it was due to their gender identity or expression. Um, and uh, when people think about grievances, right, and reporting those things, there was also seven, almost 75% of people reported being afraid of retaliation, right, which again is not always a TGNC specific is issue, but we often found that case managers, security, staff, even other residents we're targeting trans and gender non-conforming people. So I just wanted to share um, some of that data from on the ground from our folks to just illuminate uh, just how critical some of the, the health and safety issues are 
um, for TGNC folks. And I will pass it back because I know we're just going to dig deeper into this. So I appreciate yeah. um, y'all. It's really, really terrible and illuminating uh, information that um, you added there, Sasha. So thank you for that. And we are just going to keep kind of narrowing down the focus of the questions because it is such a big and complex issue. One sort of logistical thing for folks is that we are saving almost a whole half an hour at the end of this webinar to do audience question and answer. So um, right now we're not having the chat be open to everyone just because we want the focus to be on our speakers and what they're presenting to us, but you can put your questions in the Q&A and we're gonna line them up at the end. Um, so please, please put them in the Q&A. Um, as you have them. And so we're going to move on to actually, you know, Chinari, as you framed it, as you framed it, this discrimination to incarceration pipeline. So we're going to take some time to really just, uh, you know, drill down into into that phenomenon, um, starting be, because, you know, this is what we're talking about, essentially, when we're talking about the intersection um, of different criminalized identities. Uh, and so, you know, Lily gave the definition our sort of definitions of criminalization um, at the beginning of the webinar, but you know, in a nutshell, we know that there are both formal and informal ways that people are punished and excluded um, and experience violence, including state violence, um, based on who they are. So we're going to kind of break this into both levels, though they're of course very interconnected, um, but to try to just get a better sense of what's going on. So first, starting on kind of the I don't know if you want to call it informal level of of criminalization. Um, you know, I'm hoping, or let's start there. I guess I would say, and because we know, as you guys talked about, trans and gender non-conforming folks in this country are continually, you know, targeted by pervasive and systemic discrimination, exclusion, and violence. So, can we take a just a minute to talk about? how specifically this environment of discrimination, I guess the front end of that discrimination to incarceration pipeline, how does this feed um, poverty and housing insecurity and homelessness among uh, trans folks? So Sasha, I know you have a great flow chart on the issue. So why don't we start with you? Awesome. Um, and I hope folks can see this. I don't know if it, um... Is there a possibility to make it any a little bit bigger? Maybe not. I think the size depends on what people are. Oh, people screens. Okay. Yeah. Um, as long as people can see it, I just um, was thinking in terms of ac access. So yeah, so this is a chart. Folks can also um, find this on Sylvia Rivera Law Project's website under resources. Uh, it's a chart we made to kind of show how poverty and homelessness are impacting trans and gender non-conforming people specifically and some of the ways people move through different systems um, and kind of the interlocking systems of oppression uh, that continue to make trans people uh, vulnerable. And so in the top left corner for folks, it says barriers to education, right? And it talks about a lot of folks dropping out or I would say being pushed out um, of school due to harassment, violence and or discrimination at school. Um, continually a lack of supportive GED programs, right? So obviously like the lack of uh, education uh, impacts folks, uh, folks ability to, uh, you know, be able to get a job, be able to um, support themselves. And there's obviously a lot of discrimination within education when folks do try to seek that out. The other box there says, can't apply for school or access to higher education due to lack of ID or because their ID doesn't reflect their name or gender. Uh, and school records are often hard to update and correct, right? So, so for someone who might have uh, gotten education, uh, they can't necessarily continue their education when they have identity documents that they are not able to uh, have that reflect their identity and where they're going to experience discrimination. Um, and obviously that then can lead to people being low income or having no income because there's discrimination and hiring in the workplace. Uh, as, you know, Kayla was just saying, you know, there's a uh, few laws that prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of gender identity, and it's hard to find trans aware legal assistance uh, and difficult to prove discrimination, right? This is part of why the Sylvia Rivera Law Project exists um, in 2002 when the project was started by Dean Spade 
It was because trans people were experiencing pervasive discrimination. And when they were going to uh, legal service providers, people were not culturally competent and did not understand the intersections of how people's gender identity, uh, you know, on top of being low income or being black or being disabled, right? Um, and, and not knowing that, then it might be hard to prove, right? Thankfully, we have amazing lawyers like Chinyere and folks who, who do that better now for us. Um, we have unequal access to benefits there, right? Again, because the benefit applications require ID, uh, folks have issues uh, in terms of being able to access that. We have folks who even are discriminated against when they go down um, to access their benefits, are harassed, are made fun of, right? That impacts people being able to um, have an income. Obviously, people then uh, can't always apply for jobs or access employment because of the lack of ID or their ID doesn't reflect their gender. Um, there's plenty of experiences of that. Like I said, even in a place like New York City where people feel uh, it's more progressive and there's supposed to be um, practices to you know, like stop that from happening to folks, um, but it still happens. And uh, obviously without having low or no income, right? That can uh, obviously, uh, affect your health care, having inadequate uh, or lack of access to health care, persistent severe medical problems, um, not being able to access trans specific uh, physical or mental health care needs, and bias and discrimination in medicine. All of those things obviously contribute to negative health, health outcomes for folks um, and also keep people cycling through um, these cycles, right, that make them at risk for homelessness, which is our last box here in the bottom left of your screen. It says homelessness or at risk for homelessness. And it says in the top uh, box, permanent housing isn't accessible due to housing discrimination and private housing market. Low income housing options are offered gender segregated and trans people are rejected for placement. Um, this we see happen actually all the time. I'm gonna talk about it later in New York City where supportive housing is the uh, idea to fix homelessness. Um, we saw pervasive uh, discrimination in the interview process to be able to get uh, an interview placement into, um, into a long-term housing unit, which was impacting people getting out of the shelter and then therefore, therefore continuing to experience pervasive harassment there uh, and sometimes just leaving and going back on the street, right? Um, a lot of folks, which I think this is known about the LGBT community, but um, we make up a, a huge population of, uh, of homeless youth specifically. And I do think the numbers of homeless adults um, are lower than people uh, actually are in the systems. A lot of folks are kicked out of their homes. Um, this is also somewhere I would name Silver River Law Project specifically. We have a lot of clients who are currently incarcerated in New York State and throughout the country. And um, when we have folks come home from prison and jail, many folks do not have people to return home, home to for many reasons. And they end up into the shelter system where we'll talk about like there's criminalization um, and it's very carceral in the, in the shelter system. One of our members came home after 25 years, she went into the shelter system because most of her family had passed away or would not um, accept her to come to their home. And that meant she was in the shelter where she was like, I'm a number again. There's a window into my room, there's security, there's metal detectors, there's a curfew. Like, she's like, this is like, this is like prison and jail. Right, um, so I just want to name that as another um, issue. And obviously temporary housing is often inaccessible um, due to gender segregated shelters, uh, just not having trained staff. So frequently we'll hear this, particularly from trans women, um, you know, in terms of uh, going to shelter and trying to access it and being literally turned away and told they cannot be there. Um, and so obviously all of these, you know, four, large areas of, of inequality. Um, a lot of our folks kind of circle through these different pieces and um, experience discrimination in all of them. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so I, I guess this is maybe where I would pause um, and open it up. I know this is, I've been talking New York City specific, but obviously we've also been talking on a national level um, and there's very different ways this uh, impacts, I don't know, uh, impacts folks sometimes in their local communities, but in general, I think when we think about interse intersections and systems of oppression, um, these are four areas that are always driving folks um, towards houselessness, right, or homelessness, but just being able for folks who are listening to understand the nuances of how uh, trans or gender nonconforming people might uniquely experience these things um, and the lack of culturally competent care um, to move through those things. So. Um, I can't underscore that, honestly, just as a service provider myself, working with other direct service providers, how 
absolutely mind blowing it is that there are policies that state otherwise and that um, people who are supposed to be helping people are contributing to that discrimination um, and to that violence. And so it's super important that we interrupt that. Um, yeah, I'll pause here uh, and pass it back to you, Alex and folks. Well, I'll pass it to, you know, to either Janere or Kayla. Um, Kayla, I'd actually particularly love to hear from, you know, as your work is happening in Tennessee, you know, I'd love to hear the perspective of, you know, um, the, you know, particulars of how, of how this plays out in the South as well. So, uh, as I said before, and as Sasha said, it, it literally is universal, uh, the discrimination that trans people face. I would say that it's true that on the West Coast and on the East Coast, there are more policies in place, but as Sasha said, people can't access those policies. They're not living in the means in which they are able to access those policies, or they don't have the, the knowledge about what those policies actually mean and how to affect them. Um, so yeah, I, I, I honestly can say that it mirrors, I don't think that one area is worse than the other, but I will say that that here in Memphis, there are no there are no voucher programs for uh, LGBT individuals. If there are housing initiatives, they are led by the community. There's nothing that city led um, or nothing that comes from the city that signifies that they're they're opening up opportunities for LGBT people. And I'll take you back to the beginning of the pandemic when we had safer at home orders uh, from the federal government. And the local counties were charged with making sure that people who were houseless had somewhere to go. But the language that was put out by our health departments were, you know, fam women and families. We have housing for women and families. Um, and what I had to like let the leaders of those organizations know is that that language does not speak to my community. You have to you have to illicitly say trans and gender non-conforming. You have to illicitly say non-binary people. You have to say those, put those words in your language so that our community understands that they have access to that, that service, that resource. Uh, so I, I, it mirrors, it's universal. The discrimination weighs heavy in the South, especially when it comes to accessing housing, when it comes to accessing um, healthcare. Um, and like Sasha said, there are a lot of people who are working within systems that are supposed to help people uh, and they're making it very much harder. And I normally don't make the comparison in my life uh, of how I access services prior to my transition and then how I access services throughout the, you know, the beginning stages of my transition and how I saw walls go up versus when I was you know, presenting as a, a, a gay black man like walls were coming down, there were no walls. And then as I started to gradually transition, walls went up. And I was in a, a transitional housing program and I, I'm in their program and walls are going up as I'm starting to be who I am. And that, a lot, like, that alone got me kicked out of the housing program because of the stigma and the stereotypes that black trans women are, are grouped with those were things that they were in fear of me doing or having done in their housing program. So yeah, it mirrors, uh, but I definitely think it weighs really, really heavy uh, on, on, on trans Southerners. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would um, add here are just, you know, some of um, the perspectives that I have of the barriers um, facing trans folks um, when it comes to sort of achieving economic stability and stable housing um, that come from my experience as, as an attorney. And so um, a few years ago um, when the Supreme Court was deciding whether um, sex discrimination encompassed discrimination against people who are trans as well as people who are LGB, um, my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, partnered with the Transgender Law Center and um, about 40 other incredible groups from all across the United States to um, submit what we termed a trans voices um, amicus brief to the court that really explained why um, it was so important that, um, that the court um, find as it ultimately did in the Bostock case 
that um, sex discrimination um, protects uh, laws, pro you know, pro prohibiting sex discrimination protect members of, of our communities. And you know, what's really singular about that brief, and I'd be happy to share a link to it, is that um, it had, you know, quite as as the description suggests, um, the the voices of so many people in the community who were willing to share their stories of encountering employment discrimination um, and the ways um, it impacted their lives, as well as other forms of discrimination that all kind of uh, fell upon them um, because of their transgender and, um, identities. And you know, what we know from um, kind of the storytelling from people who are generous enough to kind of move past you know, the trauma of these experiences and really share them um, so we can learn and also from, from surveys and data, including the wonderful surveys that organizations like the Sylvia Vera Law Project have put out, is that again, we see a tremendous amount of discrimination towards um, trans folks that really impairs their ability to sort of, you know, you know, to, to find housing and, and to otherwise function. And so um, we know from, from, you know, these sources that trans people, and I'm, I'm gonna use that term to kind of encompass everyone on kind of the trans and, and um, gender non-conforming non-binary spectrum, you know, that um, they're four times more likely to be living in extreme poverty, which is defined as having less than $10,000 of resources to your name a year. You know, um, in, in many of the cities we live in, um, with whether it's inflation or or just you know the way of life, you know that's not even ten thousand dollars is not enough to pay rent anywhere, let alone um, have all of your basic needs met. You know, um, we also know that um, you know trans people experience outrageous amounts of employment discrimination. You know, I've had both the privilege and and the you know, the fury of representing trans folks who've experienced discrimination in um, just about all of my professional walks of life, including um, during a time that I was working within the um, US Employment, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or EEOC. And what you saw particularly prior to Bostock um, is how comfortable employers were turning transgender job applicants away. Um, and employees once they began the transition, you know, and I had experiences representing um, trans folks who lived in places in the South, including Alabama, Louisiana, Georgia, and time and again, you'd hear stories of people applying for a job, ultimately being offered that job because they were qualified, and at the point where they were asked in the employment um, screening process to submit their driver's licenses and other paperwork, you know, to kind of verify their eligibility for employment, you know, under kind of US tax laws, et cetera. Basically the documents check, you know, because of how inaccessible, particularly in Southern states, gender affirming identity documents can be because among other things, um, you know, um, a surprising number of states still have laws that archaically require um, proof of surgery, or at least a letter attesting that someone has had surgery before they're able to access um, identity documents that affirm them. You know, not to mention that right now it's only, um, you know, less than than half of states actually allow non-binary people to have any kind of gender um, marker that kind of represents, you know, their identity rather than putting them in, you know, in a binary that doesn't fit. You know, you have basically people being outed as trans you know, by their identity documents. And, you know, I've had and represented clients who, you know, were told things like, you defrauded us, you know, you pretended to be a woman, that's why I'm terminating you, you know, of, on the case of trans women or, you know, trans, you know, trans people of all spectrums being told, you know, we don't, we don't accept your kind here. And so imagine a world where basically being trans means you're unable to work, you know? And I'd like to think that Bostock, um, has kind of changed that picture a little bit, but I'm, you know, I straddle multiple identities. I know that, for instance, laws that expressly prohibit racial discrimination have hardly stopped it. It's just made it go underground. And so, you know, until unless or until we see much meaningful, um, much more meaningful employment of trans folks, you know, my suspicion is going to be that those same biases and attitudes will continue. Not to mention that, you know, just about every term there's been a Supreme Court case. Um, brought by, you know, what I would describe as a growing, um, you know, here to stay, you know, conservative 
uh, legal rights movement, conservative, you know, impact bar that is bringing cases to the court seeking to carve out these exceptions from generally applicable anti-discrimination laws that would in effect allow people to discriminate, turn away both as employees, you know, clients, customers, people who are, you know, from the trans community or, or, or from the LGBT, you know, Q plus um, community more broadly, you know, on, on grounds of their, you know, alleged religious freedom. And, you know, even though, you know, arguments like that were made and appropriately failed in the context of, you know, people, you know, claiming shortly in the wake of the Civil Rights Act's passage in, you know, 1964 that, you know, religion entitled them to refuse service to, to black folks, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, we obviously um, are dealing with the Supreme Court that's on steroids um, and that is convinced, you know, there's really only two constitutional rights that matter, the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. Um, and so I'm not, you know, beyond thinking that um, as soon as next term, we'll have um, some proclamation from the court that explains that, you know, religiously motivated discrimination against people in our community, you know, is, is a First Amendment right that's protected. And so, um, again, you know, in a world where basically being trans means you can't work, of course you can't, you know, find and keep housing. Of course you're going to be navigating, um, you know, homelessness. And of course you're going to be engaging in other modes of survival that um, put you directly in the crosshairs of our criminal you know, quote unquote justice system. I think we all um, know that's a misnomer, but you know, um, you know, more than a third of transgender respondents who were surveyed in 2015 when uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality conducted a 28,000 person, um, you know, nationwide trans survey, you know, um, more than a third of those respondents admitted that at some point in their lives, they'd engaged in sex work or other forms um, of, of you know, participation in other criminalized economies to survive. And we know that is true. We know that, you know, um, you know not only um, is sex work stigmatized, you know, it is something that leads, you know, leads our people into the system of mass incarceration along with so many other, you know, um, modes of survival that are really uh, occasioned and become necessary um, because of the ways that um, they're excluded from, from public life, from education, from employment. Um, in ways that we need to, uh, we must continue to fight. So I'll turn it back to you, Alex. Thank you. And you actually uh, made that, you know, transition for me, that segue into, you know, talking about the ways that this leads into the, the types of formalized criminalization that we're um, talking about. So sort of just, you know, turning to, to that, part of this discussion, um, you know, when looking at the ways that, you know, and Janari, you were just talking about some of them, the ways that this type of discrimination and violence um, ends up being codified into actual laws and ordinances that, you know, serve to make certain people and certain identities illegal. Um, that's at the Law Center. We talk about this when we're dealing with the criminalization of homelessness as a status and of what it means to make criminal the activities that are inherently connected to what it means to be houseless and to be sleeping in public. Um, but so, you know, I guess turning to, like, can, can we talk about, or can you all talk about, um, you know, a little bit more flesh that point out a little bit more that you made, Shanaria, about that pipeline of how then those things, what are the ways that those identities and discriminations are ending up as codified into law. And so if it's helpful, you know, thinking about things like the criminalization of um, sex work or drug use or, and, you know, Kayla, you kind of talked about this in the context of um, the justifications that providers give to exclude trans people and the fears of these things. So like, what are the, what are the laws that are propping this up? What are the like formal types of criminalization that are that trans and gender nonconforming and housed people are facing. So uh, here in the state of Tennessee and in Memphis, uh, we have a lot of anti-trans legislation. We have a lot of anti-trans laws. Uh, a lot of places have had legislation, but they've never become laws. 
Tennessee is a pioneer with that. Uh, we have a governor, a sitting governor who, um, who, who really seeks to criminalize the parents of LGBT children, specifically trans children. We have a governor who seeks to criminalize educators who attempt to deviate from what's in the manual and attempt to insert anything that would be deemed as LGBTQ friendly <laughs> uh, when it relates to the teaching of history, uh, any really, really any subject. Those are some of the, 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 the criminalization law that, the laws that criminalize our existence, I'm sorry, uh, but those are some of the laws that criminalize our existence. We also have laws here, uh, which is a signage uh, bill, um, well, was a signage bill that became a law where it requires businesses in the state of Tennessee to post signage that says, we serve trans people, uh, which could cause harm, which could either their business being successful uh, because some people may come in and say, I don't wanna eat where trans people are eating at. It's really, for me, it's settling for me and it's giving, um, you know, whites only, colored or colored only signage that's what it's giving me however there's 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 a, a brighter side to it where there's advocacy going on where there are businesses that are saying welcome tennessee and that's a, that's an initiative that's led by a group called the tennessee equality project here uh based in nashville uh, they're a, a policy organization, and they have gotten businesses in the state of Tennessee to post signage that says, we serve everybody. We don't discriminate against anyone, you know. And what we see here in Tennessee is, is, is very much similar to what's happening all over the South, is the criminalization of people's bodies, of, of their ability to make choices for themselves. Uh, and what we see that it does is it's like uh, Cherney, and I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, and I, I used to it's a tongue twister, Cherney, but you got it. You're okay. good. Awesome. But like you were saying about the legal documentation uh, and how people, how it's very inaccessible in the South. That's a very true thing. Um, I'm a part of a lawsuit that's been going on for probably about three years now. Uh, that that uh, cites our current governor. It cites our Tennessee Department of Health because it's uh, it's blocking the access for trans people to be able to change their gender markers on their birth certificates. Everywhere else in the state, we can change our our, our gender marker on our insurance card, on our social security uh, documentation, on our identification. We can do that, uh, but we also have to have that letter that says the person has completed gender reassignment from one gender to the other, which that could be a, a array of things. It doesn't have to necessarily be surgery. Uh, it could be hormone replacement therapy. It could be talk therapy. It could be with any type of medical professional who can write that letter and say that you've com you, they've confirmed you to be this thing that you say you are and you've made the transition. Uh, and a lot of our providers make it very easy and simple for people to get access to that letter, but it serves no real purpose if we can't change all of our documents. And for a lot of social services that we apply for, a lot of higher education that we apply for, any type of federal assistance we apply for, we need two forms of identification. And one of those documents is the birth certificate. And that birth certificate or passport, but normally it's the birth certificate, um, but that birth certificate, like 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 it was said, like Charity said, it outs trans people in employment settings, in education settings, in any type of setting where they have to submit two forms of identification. And one says this thing and the other says the total opposite. It puts people in danger uh, and it makes people fearful of seeking out, you know, anything outside of the norm. And, you know, because I think part of this conversation is connecting back to um, how we then see um, heightened and disproportionate participation in the system of mass incarceration, you know, I do want to lift up that, you know, the same studies that have shown, you know, 30% of trans people, you know, are living below the poverty line, you know, have shown that, you know, 49% of, of people who identify as Black and trans, you know, have or will um, be, you know, subjected to the system of mass incarceration, you know, and, 
um, that is such, um, you know, a ubiquitous phenomenon for so many um, folks who are trans, you know, black and poor. And, you know, so often the reasons are, you know, one of two things, you know, either their participation in, in criminalized economies or, or kind of, you know, to the extent that we call it crime at all, I would say survival, survival crime, you know, I'm, I've been representing um, for several years now across two legal fights, a black trans woman in Georgia named Ashley Diamond, who received a 12 year prison sentence for quite literally pawning a saw that was um, later found to be stolen for which she received a burglary charge, even though they had no evidence that she had ever entered anyone's home, removed the saw, et cetera. And I'm talking like a construction saw that cost 500 bucks at Home Depot, you know, and um, writing about $500 in bad checks. So those two offenses led a black trans woman in Georgia to be sentenced, you know, to, to prison for 12 years where, you know, not only has she been the victim of repeated um, sexual abuse, you know, she, she's going to go home to a community where, you know, every landlord, every, you know, person who's able to control her destiny when it comes to housing is going to be able to see that she's, you know, what we label a felon, you know, to see, you know, through her identity documents that, you know, um, that she has an M on her on her driver's license and, you know, be able to basically decide, you know, yes or no, whether they'd like to have a black transgender, you know, so-called felon in their housing community. And so oftentimes, you know, people's participation, you know, or people's experiences being in the mass, this is a mass incarceration, you know, become another um, push factor for homelessness because there are, you know, no federal laws and oftentimes no state or municipal laws that, you know, ban the box that prevent people um, from making an up or down decision on your prospects for housing, your prospects for employment, simply based on whether you've been in the system. So again, um, we're really creating kind of an impossible situation for people, or if nothing else, you know, we're really almost guaranteeing that um, that trans folks, you know, because of the ways they experience discrimination, will also experience homelessness in their lifetimes. I'd like to add a little bit uh, more to that, like uh, in speaking about victimless crimes, uh, and that's what I like to call sex work uh, or survival sex is a victimless crime because both parties leave pretty much, you know, happy, satisfied, nobody's hurt in the transaction. Um, but there are always criminalization of both parties if police are involved. And there's always that occurrence of that. And then also to talk about the F, the felon, the felony on your record and what that does to trans people as well. For a lot of trans people, and I'm gonna use myself for an example. I was, I didn't have nothing to do. Memphis was a city where the kids didn't really have a lot of programming. We still don't have a lot of program for our youth, which meant I got in trouble all the time. And I ended up catching a felony. And when I decided to transition maybe 10 years later, that felony didn't catch up to me until I wanted to transition and I wanted to change my gender marker. And that prevented me, it, and it didn't prevent me. It, it, it put a delay because I fought and I got it changed, but initially I couldn't get my, my gender marker changed. And it had played, it had worried me and it depressed me because I, here I am a person who's gotten over 150 people gender markers change and I can't get it changed myself because I create I committed offense that the system deemed a felony 10 or 15 years ago and now I'm being punished for it I'm not being able to be my authentic self and I'm I'm I could literally not be able to access employment not be able to access anything because I don't want to present identification that says uh, M on it and but I had to fight. And a lot of people um, do not know the process of actually having to fight to get your, your right to change your uh, gender marker because they, they say you, you could be committing fraud or you could be evading something. You, there's a lot that you have to prove. And if you're not really savvy when it comes to like a courtroom or any like, I, I think it's called legalese. Um, am I saying that right? <laughs> yeah, so if you're not, 
familiar with those things. Uh, and as a person who court watched for almost three years in, in the probate court, I started to learn how I could change my name, even though I had a felony. I just had to prove to the courts that I wasn't doing anything illegal or trying to be fraudulent. I just wanted to be my authentic self. Uh, and I had to bring people who are character witnesses into the courtroom. Uh, but the judge wasn't going to tell me that because the judge had, you know, exhibited xenophobia on several different occasions with people um, who were not originally born here in the United States who were coming into court to change names or letters in their uh, children's names or whatever reason she had exhibited transphobia. Uh, specifically with Black trans people trying to access the, the name change process through the indigent way. Um, and she refused to allow people to use the indigent process. And she would question you about, oh, your hair is done and your nails are done, but you can't pay for your name change. And, 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 and so I knew I had an uphill battle, but I was willing to, you know, go the extra mile to figure out how to do this because now I'm opening up a pathway for not only myself, but other people in the same situation because it plagued me. I, I had never had issues with the felony on my record because of work ethic, uh, work history, you know, and me just being a really, really sociable people person. Everybody doesn't have that. Uh, but it, it hit me when I transitioned that I wasn't going to be fully who I said I was. And I would always have to go back to being uh, the person that society thinks I am and, and thinks I should be. I just wanted to add um, before I move on um, to everything that's already said that I just think historically too, you know, there's a context um, for trans and gender nonconforming people being criminalized for our identities solely, like solely as trans and gender non-conforming people. And I was thinking about, you know, it was just June and Pride and everybody celebrates Stonewall and all of these things, right? But a lot of that comes back to the three article or three piece clothing law that existed at the time that criminalized mainly lesbian women and uh, gender non-conforming people who, if they didn't have three articles of clothing that matched the, you know, the gender marker on the ID could be criminalized for that, right? And even though that is like 60, you know, plus years ago, I think about just a few years ago, the, uh, we called it walking while trans law um, here in New York City, which was just an archaic, uh, pro like anti-loitering law from the seventies um, was just, was just um, removed. And um, I know particularly people, you know, young black trans women who were impacted by that um, walking while trans, the profiling that was happening. And I wanted to connect that back to houselessness and that there are a lot of people in shelter. And when you're in shelter in New York City, you cannot be there during the day. You cannot even be there. You have to be there by curfew, right? But during the day, you're supposed to be out. And if you're out and you're on 42nd Street or one of these areas that is um, that law enforcement were target targeting women, right? Like people were arrested and people were, um, were accused of prostitution, right? When they were really just, they're like houseless people. I mean, they can't, literally can't be in the shelter during the day. And so you're gonna be criminalized for being out and for being a woman and a woman of color because that was also impacting 90% of the people were like black and Latinx women. So I just, um, yeah, obviously like there's a lot of intersections here. And I know one of the flow charts we threw up here also looks at, um, both the criminalization of, of poor and homeless folks and the criminalization of trans people. Um, and then specifically once people are actually in the criminal justice system, um, also provide some examples of how people are, are, how that criminalization like further harms folks. And I just wanted to share again, you know, because of those systems of oppression that we looked at, right? When you can't get an education, you can't get a job, right? You will likely be, might be forced into some sign of some kind of survival economy, right? Like many people in our community are, and then they're simply going to be criminalized, like Janetta said earlier, for not being able to get a job, right? Um, and for being trans, they're going to be targeted, right? On top of that, um, and I shared earlier too, a lot of our folks come home from prison and jail and into shelter, um, and I just, you know, I wanted to to say like what's so challenging about, about this is that um, our folks who come home from prison and jail and to shelter then experience violence. And we've had so many people who end up going back into, into Rikers um, or into prison because they experienced harm in a shelter, defended themselves, 
and ended up back in the criminal justice system. And, um, and so I just, I think it's really important to draw these connections between shelter and jail and other sex segregated spaces where people are criminalized for being disabled um, or, uh, or poor, right? And, um, and just the carceral nature of, of shelter that exists. So I know we don't have a ton of time, so maybe uh, um, we can move on from there, but unless Chinyere or um, Kayla have more. I can't resist just, you know, having one further um, brief reflection on, on the state of criminalization, you know, um, you know, this year, in addition to bringing us the repeal of Roe v. Wade, you know, a, a bedrock constitutional, you know, principle for, you know, several generations at this point, something that's ordered the way that so many people with reproductive capacity think about, you know, their ability to participate in society and, and have bodily autonomy. You know, we also saw uh, a legislative cycle where state legislatures, you know, that are controlled by conservatives were on steroids. And, you know, in every state where there was a way, you know, some law was passed, um, you know, criminalizing some aspect um, of, of transgender experience. And so right now, you know, we also have people who can literally go to jail in Alabama, you know, but for an injunction um, being secured by, you know, by, by talented lawyers. You know, but there was an attempt by the state legislature to criminalize trans people, you know, who are 19 years. So that includes, you know, people being, you know, the age that they can vote, go to war, et cetera, you know, um, from just accessing trans, you know, gender affirming health care. That was a crime, made it made it made a crime, you know. And um in Texas, you know, that we saw um, you know, Greg Abbott make steps to um, basically say that any parent that affirms their transgender child, lets them access health care, you know, affirms their gender identity, respects their pronouns, et cetera, is basically, you know, could be the subject of a child abuse investigation, which, you know, um, Black folks, you know, brown folks know that um, child protective services are the police as well, you know, and under the auspices of neglect, not, you know, not abuse statutes, but, you know, the idea of neglect, which in essence is just a way of describing typically poverty, but now apparently in Texas, also you love your trans, you know, kid, you know, people lose access to their, their children. And when we look at the, the outrageous rates of, you know, um, homelessness um, among, you know, trans, gender youth, where again, you look at all, you know, homeless children sleeping out in the streets and you see that, you know, up to 40% of them are LGBTQ+, you know, which is 120% higher than, you know, than average given the population size. You know, you see stories of people, you know, being forced into foster care systems where they're abused, aging out of foster care systems, being pulled out, pulled away from their families, you know, and now we're going to see instances where that's happening, even with people whose families love them. Again, you know, lawyers are stepping in to sort of, you know, um, react and respond. But between that, between knowing that trans people, you know, carry, you know, you know, are capable of pregnancy too, and at times, you know, have unwanted pregnancies, and realizing that for so many people in the South, you know, where if you're a trans man being pregnant, you know, against your will or without planning could exacerbate your gender dysphoria, people are gonna be having to decide between, you know, having really poor mental health or accessing reproductive care that has been suddenly criminalized in your state where you can be going to jail for that. And again, you know, basically being put on this path that almost um, with certainty leads to homelessness. So, um, you know, I, I think again, we need to really um, keep our eyes on criminalization and, and fight back um, against it in all of its forms. Once again, Chinere, you just, you know, made the segue for us, but, you know, just before we, because we do, we, this conversation has been incredible so far and, you know, we're going, we're eating into the Q&A time, but I think it's for good reason. But I just want to prompt folks that before we move on to talking about strategies for advocacy, if you have, you know, questions related to all that information, um, that you just got, like, please put it in the Q and A or send it to the hosts um, on in chat so we can kind of queue up your questions. Um, we we are gonna save some time at the end, but so please do that. Ask your questions to us. Um, but pivoting towards this, uh, the strategies, you know, I just you know love to give you each a few minutes and you know maybe 
you know, start us off with like, you know, two, two, two plus minutes to get it rolling. And then we can have a bigger conversation about just the, like, what are the strategies that you are using um, to deal with this? Uh, and then we're going to save a tiny couple minutes to talk about like what homelessness movements were generally um, could be doing better before we move to question and answer. But if you could just each, you know, tell us more about the work you've been doing and or the work you've been either through your jobs or through your organizing or through coalitions you're involved in, um, we'd love to hear more about the strategies you're using. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start uh, start us off. Um, so some of the strategies, one of the main strategies that we're using um, to, to fuel the tiny house project is mutual aid. And we're utilizing mutual aid because it gives us autonomy over what we're doing, how we're doing it, who we're doing it for, and at the rate that we can do it. Um, a lot of times when we are when we were taking funding for my sister's house, a lot of that funding was very restricted. A lot of that funding had a lot of reporting to come with it. A lot of that funding had more work that we were doing for the funders than we were actually doing for the people who we were serving, who we were assisting, uh, our members. Um, so yeah, that's one of the main things that we're doing. That's one of the main strategies is making sure that the community is involved in every aspect of the organizing, of the fundraising, um, of the designs of the homes, of the areas where the homes are being built. Uh, people are, are that's, that's, that's one of the main strategies of making sure that we are infiltrated through all throughout with youth, with people who are of the aging community, with people with all kinds of different living disparities uh, within our group. And, I, and me personally, I just wanna make sure that I'm hitting every, every, like every group within our group, because I wanna make sure that when we're doing, cause we're actually un, under, uh, under doing, we're doing research now uh, on the project to see what the efficacy of the project is, how it's helped people in their uh, in their lives. We've had the longest person we've housed is a year and a half. She's been in her home for a year and a half, almost two years, um, and we have one person, two people who've actually been in their home for about six months, which is um, which is I think. Is making a huge difference in their lives, but we want to get some actual researchers um, who this is what they do for a day to day uh, living to actually come in and do surveys and do interviews with people and do focus groups with our tiny house recipients just to make sure that we're hitting the mark and we're not missing anything and that we can also share this information with our elected officials to say this is something that has worked because we have uh, sought out funding from our city council before uh, when they were redoing their budget, but of course, you know, they're not they're not really concerned about housing specific communities. They're more so concerned about spending multi million dollars on on men and women's shelters, and they're leaving out a big a big group of people um, when they're spending multi millions of dollars. And we've only we haven't even spent a million dollars, and we have. 10 homes scheduled to be completed by December that's going to house people for the rest of their lives and it's not going to be temporary. Another thing that we have learned throughout the whole process, we've been doing this for five years, three years with emergency housing and two years with the tiny homes. And what we've learned is that people who have been through the shelter process and then we have them now situated in homes that they're able to do more. Here in the shelter, they they always had this looming feeling of I only have 30 days here, you know, and I have to hurry up and get a job and I have to hurry up and, and get my health care in order and I have to hurry up and figure out my relationships and my friendships so that I can move to the next level. But once they're in permanent housing, whether they have income or not, that's their time to for us in Memphis, we, we call it grit and grind time for, from our Memphis Grizzlies, but that's their grit and grind time. And, and I see people who are elevating themselves out of, um, out of work that can be criminalized to gaining employment, getting higher education, uh, creating families. Um, as Sharon, you said before, like trans people are families. We are untraditional families when it comes to society's view, but we create families as well. Um, so yeah, those are some of the strategies, the strategies that we're using. I'm gonna pass it on to uh, either Sasha or Tyranny just to 
add to what's going on uh, in their perspective areas. And I can jump in there real quick and just share. Um, well, at SROP, you know, obviously we have a, we're a legal project and we also do movement building. It's kind of our multi-pronged approach, right? When folks are experiencing violence and discrimination, harassment, they might very well have legal issues, but on our organizing side, we can support people and mobilize around those issues um, in a different way. And so um, a lot of our work, or our strategy, I would say, involves movement lawyering. So working with lawyers, there's a, um, a period of time, actually, I'm gonna drop in the chat um, our DHS is a mess, our campaign around shelter organizing that we had launched. And there's actually a photo on the front of that campaign from a town hall we did with Center for Constitutional Rights. So really building, connecting, uh, base building with folks who are directly impacted in shelters um, to both like uh, teach people their, their rights, grow people's leadership and decision-making skills. Um, we've been able to do that by then like launching a campaign and very effectively meeting with the administration um, to try to make changes and put pressure on them for the things that trans and gender non-conforming people were doing. The other thing I'll name really quickly is that actually led to us realizing that the solution to the shelter system, which is supportive housing, well, there was also a nightmare of issues going on there um, and different ways um, TGNC people were being impacted. And so actually our members were part of launching the Shout uh, Coalition, which is uh, uh, made up of people, tenants in support of housing. And in um, uh, December of 2021, we advocated for the New York City Council to pass the first ever supportive housing tenant bill of rights. Um, and in May, as of May 9th, 2022, every supportive housing provider in New York City is required to provide every tenant in supportive housing with a notice clearly explaining their tenancy rights and detailing key information about their housing. And so a lot, again, um, of our strategies have involved like policy, advocacy directly for uh, people who are experiencing violence and um, organizing and movement building to build power. So I will maybe pause there and send it over to Chinietta. Um, And so, you know, I'm sort of pushing back as, as one of the movement lawyers of, of, of many, although more are needed, that are trying to work at this intersection of criminalization and homelessness. Um, I had the privilege of, of working on a case um, that resolved last November against the New York City Department of Homeless Services. I'm dropping a, a link um, in the chat that kind of summarizes the case, um, but in partnership with um, a lot of community orgs, including um, Sasha and Sylvia Vera Law Project, you know, um, we used a, a litigation that was brought by a, a Black trans woman with disabilities who um, was discriminated on both um, accounts of all of her identities while um, seeking shelter within the New York City homeless shelter system to really, um, you know, engage with community more broadly and understand, you know, kind of what was on their wish list for shelter reform if we were trying to use the lawsuit as a harm reduction tool to make um, the, the city shelters safer, um, you know, and um, and more suited to, to to you know the trans community that is so desperate for housing. So um, we did we did secure a settlement um, that we are in the process of implementing um, and monitoring. Um, that you know calls for the development of trans affirming shelters in New York, that will be a complement to the existing shelter system offerings. Um, along with um, required training and, you know, dissemination of anti-discrimination policies, things that, you know, frankly, it's, it's a little horrifying that for years, um, you know, weren't really on offer already um, within the shelter system. You know, we don't view it as a panacea and um, we're looking to all the, in the community to kind of continue to sort of um, report back about, you know, whether shelters, you know, feel safer or not. And, um, you know, the fact that we have the five-year settlement um, monitoring period is really going to enable us, um, we hope, to just continue to make um, and elevate demands from the community um, about, you know, about what safety looks like. Um, you know, and I, I do think this is a model that whether it's through policy work or through, um, you know, litigation, um, you know, has some promise of, of, of um, working in jurisdictions other than New York. Um, but, you know, Again, I, I'll be honest that I think harm reduction is um, with, in all these systems and all these junctures where you, you know you see the forces of discrimination at play that really um, have 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 led to this homelessness crisis. 
you know, just whatever interventions um, we're able to manage as a community, you know, sort of what's needed. And um, I'll be publishing an article um, later this year that I think identifies more interventions um, that could be helpful. So um, if you follow me on, on social media, um, I'll be sharing out about, about that um, article when it's released. And I'll drop my, my Twitter link as well. That's great. And Janera, did you want to share that PowerPoint or did, did that stuff just kind of cover what would have been? I that? think that was, um, given the time, I want to, I want to make space for questions. Um, so I think we can um, just pivot to questions if, unless Michael panelists have anything else they want to share. Okay, well, you know, when we planned this, we were like an hour and a half is a really long webinar and it turns out that it really is not when you get three brilliant people in the room. So we unfortunately do have to wrap it up, but um, you know, we have one more question that Lily and I are gonna hold for the end, which is around, you know, the sort of call to action in the sort of movement to end and decriminalize homelessness and what your thoughts on that. But we did get one question in the chat. Um, so I'll ask that of you now and any one of you can just, you know, jump in. Um, so this is from James Campbell. Can you speak a bit more to the on the health effects of being unhoused? What might some of the most effective ways to bring healthcare and other clinical services to TGNC folks? What might be, sorry, some of the most effective ways to bring healthcare and other clinical services to unhoused TGNC folks? I mean, I'll jump in there and I guess just share, um... I guess just to speak more about the health impacts. I mean, obviously there's, um, you know, physical, uh, emotional and mental uh, health impacts. And, um, you know, a lot of our members have talked about like the deep effects of, of uh, how traumatizing the shelter is. Um, and so obviously in terms of mental health, there's a lot of, uh, of impact there. And then there's not a lot of access to mental health services at all. Um, I mean, the shelters don't even have Wi-Fi. There's just a bill now requiring them to have Wi-Fi. But talk about over COVID, if anybody had telehealth or, or needed any kind of services that way, they weren't able to even get them. Um, we had members who had to go to a Starbucks, right, or go all the way to a ferry or a public place where they could get on Wi-Fi, but maybe then they were discriminated there too, right? They were harassed for sitting, for being a low-income person who couldn't afford something in a cafe in order to get Wi-Fi or for being a trans woman in a public space. Um, and so I would say these things obviously also deeply affected people's physical health. Um, we had members who are wheelchair bound, who were not even able to access shelter. Um, Marsh's House, which is the only LGBT shelter in the city for adults, well, people under 35, does not have an elevator um, and uh, you know places where um, our, our members were I mean and some of this is not TGNC specific right there was uh, an elevator that was out for six months that when we told the the Department of Homeless Services about it they didn't even believe us until somebody went over there and verified it had been off for months um, and people were carrying people up the stairs um, residents were carrying each other up the stairs who had walkers who, who otherwise couldn't so that obviously um, is exacerbating for people's health conditions. We had one young, we had one woman who um, she basically had almost had a heart attack twice um, while she was trying to get placed um, because of what she was going through in the shelter. And she always says this, like she, she literally almost died twice um, because of being in shelter and the level of stress um, on her physical body from doing that. So I would just say in terms of like the impacts on people's health, um, like it's devastating. I'll also say I have had members who um, uh, we lost one member last summer took his own life in shelter. Um, he had been homeless most of his life um, and that deeply impacted him, you know, his mental health and his physical health. Right. And so it's really a life or death issue for a lot of people, um, especially people with disabilities. Um, uh, and then I would say to the part of how can we enhance the, the services um, I think this is both on the, I mean, the shelter does a terrible job um, at providing access to care. I mean, they always will say they'll provide Metro cards for people if they have an appointment, but we have people who often are not able to get a Metro card to get to an appointment, so they're not able to make an appointment. So I would say 
Um, there are mobile clinics that have come to shelters, but they go to a shelter like once every other week or once a month. Um, and obviously if you have like a health issue along with a lot of other people, you're not gonna get a lot of care or time seen there. Um, some have um, more frequent health care. And I would say like meeting people where they're at, literally bringing that care to folks. Trans folks have some unique health care needs in terms of gender affirming health care. Um, but all of those are services that, you know, for the most part, uh, service providers could also do a better job to reach people in shelter, I would say, you know, um, because of all the barriers that folks have um, to, to begin with getting care. And that's what I would just say maybe immediately comes into my mind. Yeah, I think, you know, um, the impacts on, on mental health of, you know, not only um, homelessness, but sort of the, the types of discrimination and, and marginalization we've been discussing all day, you know, are really profound. Um, you know, and would could be their own panel um, discussion. But, you know, I do want to lift up an organization that I think is doing really powerful work, albeit um, with a focus on youth um, out of Detroit, Michigan. They're called the Ruth Ellis Center. I'm going to drop their um, information in the chat. But, you know, they're working to build um, long term, you know, they, they, their roots are as a drop in center for LGBTQ youth um, experiencing homelessness because like everywhere, um, the amount of, of homeless LGBTQ youth are really disproportionate in Detroit for the reasons we've described. But they really, um, you know, understanding that kind of, you know, daytime drop-in services were not, were not enough. They have stepped into the housing space and are gonna be opening a supportive living center later this year. Um, and also um, have, have been rolling out healthcare clinics that are kind of attached to the places they work um, that have trans competent providers. Um, I think that's a model that, you know, admittedly will be hard to scale. Um, and, you know, a lot of places where the hostility for trans people and the competency of medical providers is really immense, but the fact that they're doing it in a Midwest city, um, you know, I think is, is a powerful model and they're doing it with state funding. And so um, I encourage folks to kind of, you know, follow them and, and um, engage more with their work yeah i'm pretty i'm not very familiar but i'm familiar with the ruth ellis center uh in detroit um from i think a conference maybe three or four years ago when i it was in detroit and we got to experience like the detroit trans life and that was like one of the major groups that was there um but i would i would say and this is not something that we're doing this is something that i've seen to be very effective with um I guess like you know, build, bridging the gap between accessing healthcare and people who are are actually houseless or homeless or experiencing homelessness uh, or on the verge of homelessness or living in poverty, because uh, a lot of different people have issues with accessing healthcare. And what I've seen is like mobile units have been very very helpful. We've learned that it's useful when we're delivering food and when we're delivering uh, clothing items to people who are experiencing homelessness. And I've seen it in action with bigger organizations with huger budgets uh, who have mobile units who are able to go to different communities throughout the city and provide services um, where people don't have access to transportation, where people don't have access to uh, free or uh, low cost healthcare, especially during the pandemic, where people could not really get out to testing sites. There were mobile units that were set up for people to be able to access healthcare. Um, I think that's the best way to, to bridge the gap uh, between people accessing healthcare um, is finding providers who are willing to come outside of the normal nine to five hours uh, and not just using those mobile units during those hours, but using those mobile units at unique hours of the night where people who don't come through their doors from nine to five will actually get serviced or assistance. Thank you all. And, you know, we are just a few minutes over, um, you know, for those folks who have to hop off, um, you know, thank you for coming and we'll be sending up a follow up email, sending out a follow up email with the recording and, you know, please share it because I feel like the amount of wisdom that has just been captured in an hour and a half is pretty profound and um, dense. So um, I will be rewatching uh, and you may all want to as well. Um, 
I, I do, if we have just like one more minute that you all can give and it can be like two words, I do want to kind of shamelessly end on the question of, you know, because we're talking about um, this, you know, was framed around how can we sort of center the movement to end and decriminalize homelessness around, you know, what trans folks and trans and gender nonconforming folks are dealing with, like, what would that look like to you to have a broader movement of allies and whatever to, to do that, to center the work they're doing um, from the experiences and the information you guys have just talked about. So if you just humor me with even a few words, I, I think it would be really helpful to the folks that are watching. I would definitely like uh, what Charity just mentioned about the Ruth Ellis Center. I'm pretty sure that there are, are organizations that have been around in the Detroit area or the Midwest for probably over 20 or 50 years. And they probably have not exuded as much change as the Ruth Ellis Center. So I would suggest to people to support those initiatives in their localities um, to de definitely donate, uh, absolutely volunteer because the more people the, who are involved in the process, the better and the easier uh, the outcome is for the people who are receiving the assistance. So those two things is supporting the underdog, the grassroots organization, because they're the people who are on the ground in the community, normally 24 hours a day because they're a part of the community, um, but they don't necessarily get all that great support. And it's really great to hear that the city is like really getting behind the Ruth Ellis Center because that's where it really counts because those are dollars that are promised and that they can actually count on. Whereas with mutual aid, it's, you know, it's like what the economy is doing <laughs> depends on how people can support this project. And we do get funding from foundations, but um, I would definitely say making sure that you're, you're putting your support where it really is gonna go the furthest. And sometimes it's not with that true and that organization that's been around for a hundred years, uh, who has 100,000 employees all over the United States. It's sometimes that local organization that's really doing the grid and the groundwork. Which is a great moment to say that if you all have learned, if you have even learned one thing in the last hour and a half, and I challenge anyone who says that they didn't, I would highly, highly recommend that you check out right on, you know, we'll send them out in the follow-up email, we'll put them in the chat in a moment, but consider donating to these folks and the work that they're doing directly, because I think Kayla, Sasha, Janere, like you're involved in things that are doing just that, that you said. So I wanted, I wanted to set, to say that, but please, Sasha and Chinari, can you can you end us off? Hire trans folks. They have the lived experience um, to speak to these problems, to help you solve these problems. And you know, we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. So again, folks like Ruth Ellis, I think it's both. My recommendation is, um, you know, both supporting them so they can continue the important work they're doing, but also, um, you know, looking to see whether you can replicate. Um, you know, things in your town that would that would really help um, rectify these crises, um, you know, where you live. And I would just add, like, what what would it look like? It It's already happening that there are places that TGNC people of color have been leading um, and centered in movements to decriminalize and in homelessness. One really beautiful example is in Atlanta, the stopping of the Atlanta city jail being built was a movement led by SNAP Coalition, which is you know, led by black and queer trans people, led gender, which is led by a formerly incarcerated black trans woman. And so I would say, what does it look like to do that? Um, it looks like right now, and it, it's been happening. And when I think about even Sylvia Rivera and her legacy of living on the West Village Pier and the Star House and um, her and Marsha P. Johnson's work, I would say again, like, what does it look like? Like, we, we have done that and we can do that. And I think our movements can do better uh, by, by remaining connected and not, and remembering how interconnected the issues that we are fighting for are. And that if you're fighting in a movement where you don't feel trans or gender non-conforming people or queer people are a part of that, then you most certainly can do better because we are a part of every single community that exists out there and our issues um, are as well. And so I would say, yeah, if you're not connected or you're like, well, this is not happening in my city or my state, you can also do better by getting connected to the grassroots organizing um, and work that people are doing. There's work all over this country um, and world. And I was here recently, I sat with a leader from Jamaica 
a black trans woman who leads trans wave over there. And she was saying it's a small island, so it's different for them, but they have a housing strategy as trans organizers. They've gotten together to even build that and mount that. And so I would say, yeah, if you're not building with trans and gender non-conforming people or organizers in your communities, um, like we're out there um, and we could use your support and your solidarity, absolutely. So that's all I would say. That was an incredibly powerful place to end. And in fact, Trinari had has already had to slip off. So I think let's end there, but thank you so much, Sasha and Kayla and Trinari and Thank you everyone who's been with us and we you know we hope that this is just one of many discussions and collaborations together um, in the future it's been really a pleasure thank you thank you all appreciate it mm -hmm.